Emitrax resistance is a reality and we need to be watching this very closely. My name is Umberto Bon Cristiani and this is Inside the Hive.tv, the show that takes you into the world of bees. If you like bees and want to know more about them, please consider to subscribe and also hit the bell button so you don't miss a single video. In a previous video about Emitrax resistance, I interviewed Dr. Frank Rinkovich from the USDA in Baton Rouge about his research regarding monitoring the resistance of varroa mite against Emitrax. Uh, the video was very well, people get very curious about, want to know more about it. So what I did was I asked authorization from American Honey Producers Association uh, where uh, Dr. Frank will give a talk about his research. So I record the whole talk and ask Frank for his authorization too. So we're going to publish this in this video today. Stick with me. If you didn't see the first video that we made, so you can find a link right here. Together with this talk, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Frank told me that he just published, there was a release of the publication, the scientific publication about his research. Everything they're going to be talking about here, uh, there is a link in the description so you can find more information about this a very important topic in beekeeping today. So I hope you enjoyed the video, it's a little longer but stick with me, there is a lot of good information that you want to hear there. Uh, thanks for watching Inside the Hive.tv, the show about bees. This video is brought to you by American Honey Producers Association, fighting for beekeepers since 1969. All right, so I'm glad to be here. This is exciting. Uh, I work at the USDA lab in Baton Rouge, but it's the Honeybee Breeding Genetics and Physiology Lab, but I've been working almost exclusively on Varroa, so I think we need to add Varroa Lab here too as well. Um, I kind of got into um, honeybees about five years ago when I was a postdoc at LSU, and I moved over to working on these projects. Uh, at the lab, we have a lot of visitors that come around and just tell us what's going on out in the real world. We can sit in our lab and we think that we're working on the most important thing. However, it's beekeepers that come and tell us, here's what's going on. When we get those kind of conversations, that's where I get ideas for projects like this. So I've been hearing some anecdotal reports about uh, control failures with amitraz. It works sometimes, but not all the time, not as consistent as it used to be. And so when I hear some of the explanation about why that is, the simplest reason for me is that it's just amitraz resistance. So then when you hear see the miniseries Chernobyl, at the end they talked about how the reactor went crazy because of these feedbacks. But when we're looking at row populations, there's a lot of tools that we could use to reduce the growth of row populations within colonies. So one of the tools that we have are miticides, IPM practices, row sense of hygienic behavior, some forage, even seasons can be important because of the different populations, different kinds of seasons, right? So all those things working in concert kind of keep row in check. However, so if we ignore all the other mechanisms to keep row in check and just rely heavily on miticides, that's when you get some unregulated population growth, row would explode and literally can uh, ruin colonies. And that also creates an over-reliance on these miticides, creates a situation that leads to, there we go, it leads to a situation where resistance is inevitable. So in the past, resistance has built to flubalinate and kumafos, but Amateur has been used for over 20 years, and we haven't had these huge widespread incidences. But resistance happens to many different pests. And so if you look in the history, what's happened with resistance, you can see here that there's many cases of resistance that have been afforded uh, over the time. So what we have here is just a graph here showing that over time, in years, the number of cases of resistance has increased. So the line that shows the A is the number of reported cases of resistance. So this is all insects, to all pesticides, all locations, all crops. So in 2010, there's about almost nearly 8,000 cases of incidents of uh, pesticide resistance. Uh, interestingly, there's more than 553 different species that have become resistant to pesticides. This is target insects and also non-target insects as well. So many species can evolve resistance. But what else is interesting too is this blue line here showing the number of different compounds to which resistance has evolved. And this is 331 different compounds across all pesticide classes. So that's really interesting because once the resistance occurs, that material becomes ineffective and now we get on this treadmill of trying new, different things, higher rates, beginning resistance. So resistance is a widespread phenomenon. It's not unique just to grow it. It happens to almost every pest that's had a pesticide applied to it. All right, so how fast can resistance develop? Before I started working on honeybees, I worked on houseflies. Um, and they are the ultimate model organism if you want to study insecticide resistance. It could happen really fast in houseflies. So in dairies in New York, when permethrin first got labeled for use, 
First year, two applications were adequate to control house site populations. Second year, now that went to 12 applications of permethrin. By the third year, you couldn't even apply it enough in higher concentrations. They had to switch products. They used um, organophosphates. So within two years, the product went from being useful to completely in ineffective. Now you think that's fast in the field. Look what happens in the lab. So house flies can re reproduce a generation every about two weeks, right? So there's this material called endoxicarb. These, be these flies have never seen this material before. Within three generations, they became incredibly resistant to it, to the point where you couldn't even put it into solution anymore. You could drop the technical material and they just laugh at it. Three generations of house flies, it's about two months. That's really fast. It can also resist them to be geographically widespread. Now I'm gonna use a row example here. So in Europe, there has been, this has been the epicenter of uh, fluvalinate resistance. So you can see here on this graph, um, in the northern part of Italy, this is the initial uh, report of uh, flu fluvalinate resistance. And you can see here these different dots represent different years in which resistance to fluvalinate has been reported. And you can see here from there, we reach out further and further and further. Now, this could either tell one of two things, either these resistant varroa are being spread through transportation, as in the case of this transportation here or else here. It also might tell us that resistance is evolving independently in these separate populations. This graph just shows the reports of incidents, but it could also show that it can evolve multiple independent times because our friend the house fly has shown that that is actually the case. So this is a, a don't worry about the details, but what this shows is that this is the resistance mechanism to pyrethroid insecticides in house flies. We have this molecular marker for DNA. We can take that sequence, put it into this really complicated stats program. Someone else does it for me. And what this is showing is that these clusters are showing independent origins of evolution of resistance to pyrethroid insecticides in house flies. The really cool part about this is that Joel Gonzalez Cabrera over at University of Valencia in Spain has this data for fluvalinate resistant varroa. So guess what he's doing? The same analysis. And I think it's going to show similar things that resistance can evolve multiple independent times. <clears throat> resistance can also be very high. So in that northern Italian population, these are the bioassay results. So we have increasing concentrations of fluvalinate, and then we have mortality on this axis. In the resistant populations, <coughs> If you compare the LC50 value, the amount of material it takes to kill half the population, it's about 53 times higher in those resistant populations. So that's a pretty substantial higher amount of fluvalinate needed to kill these varroa in these resistant populations. So what do we know about amitraz resistance in varroa? So the Ellison paper in 2000 was kind of the, the, the initial mark on amitraz resistance. So in this, study, they treated a bunch of colonies with strips of fluvalinate cumulophos or amitraz, left them there five weeks, and then measured mite population growth. And in this example here, the, strip, the colonies that were treated with fluvalinate, you saw this large increase. That's because those mites were resistant to fluvalinate, like you would expect. Um, colonies treated with cumulophos, there's a 97% decline in varroa population, so that's shown that this, this treatment is effective. However, when treated with amitraz, the populations only declined 75%. So this difference between 100% control and 75% has been interpreted as resistance. They took mites from those populations, did these bio bioassay tests, as you'll see in a little bit, and they determined the LD50 value was about 16 micrograms per vial, right? Keep that in mind, 60 micrograms. They then used that as a diagnostic concentration to go into other colonies to find out how this uh, sensitivity to amitraz varies, and lo and behold, they found varroa in Minnesota had reduced efficacy. They wanted to see about 90% mortality, like they did in Texas. They only found 33%. So this has been interpreted as the first reports of amitraz resistance in Vro North America. Pretty interesting. <coughs> Similarly, in Argentina, there's been similar reports of amitraz resistance, um, but significantly higher. About 40, <coughs> nearly 40-fold resistant to amitraz. This is technical amitraz in these glass bio bioassays. So amitraz resistance can occur. But we have to ask the question, why don't we see it everywhere? Amateur has been used for a long time, um, so we need to find out what is behind its, um, these isolated reports. Why don't we see it widespread across um, multiple operations? 
Okay, so what I wanted to do is answer a few questions here. What is a uh, baseline susceptible reference stock? Because if we don't know how, what is a sensitive stock, so these isolated stocks that you'll see, we have to know that what the baseline is. That way we can make comparisons. Secondly, we want to determine the extent and degree of amortized resistance in commercial operations, and then validate measurements of amortized resistance. So you're, I'm, going to, I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. All right, so at the lab, we don't treat with amortized. We usually use BSHBs. Um, we import some queens every now and then so we get Varroa, but we don't have any exposure to amortized at the lab. So it's an amortized naive population. We don't import many colonies, so we're not getting in Varroa from outside. And the way that we have our apiary set up is that it's kind of isolated. So we kind of know the bees that we work with are our bees. We don't get too much cross, or, uh, cross importation. So this is kind of an ideal susceptible reference. So we measure amortized resistance using two methods. Pros and cons of each are shown here. So in the vial bioassay, these are just small little glass vials that we treat with technical grain amortized on the inside. It's dissolved in acetone, let it evaporate. We then put the Varroa in there with the pupa and then measure mortality 24 hours later. The advantage of this is that we can, it's a sensitive and accurate measurement of sensitivity. We can know pretty good by defining these LC50 values about what uh, the, top, the sensitivity to amateurs is. It's a toxicological reference, we get the LC50 value, we get the slopes, we get the variation. So there's a lot of information in there. It allows for easy comparison. We just have to talk, we have to just say, here's the LC50, here's the LC50, how do they, how do they differ? Um, it also allows for early detection. So that way, resistance doesn't have to be a thousand fold before we actually can detect it. We can detect very sensitive changes in amateur sensitivity. However, the downside is, this is a completely unrealistic exposure. Vro are getting treated with technical grade amateurs on glass in a colony, right? Uh, it's also using non-formulated amateurs, amateurs, acetone, that's it. And, but it may overstate resistance. So we can find statistically significant differences, but they're probably likely to be under control with materials as formulated. So there's kind of some of the downsides. The other test that we did, I'm calling the AFR efficacy test. This is just my version of the Pettis test. And so we take a square of AFR that's as wide as it is long, and we put it into these cups. You can see it here. Um, we then take a scoop of bees, you know, three to four hundred bees, put it in there, and then we allow them to be exposed to that strip for a set period of time, then we can measure um, mite drop, as Randy already talked about. Um, this is really interesting because it's semi-realistic exposure. They are getting, the mites are on the bees, they are coming in contact with the strip, so it's semi-realistic. This is using a formulated product, this is Apovar, and it's easy to use and transferable. This is so easy. If you do sugar shakes, you can do this test. It's very, very easy. However, the downside to it is that it might only detect resistance when it's too late. So if these strips become ineffective, that might show that we're way too far down that path. So we're going to take both of these measurements, combine them so we get a mo the most accurate picture of amortized resistance. All right, so if you're going to test for Varroa, you have to use a lot of Varroa. Uh, to do these tests, especially the glass bioassay test, we need about 200 mites per apiary. So we'll go sample each um, about eight to 10 colonies and we'll use these sugar shakes. So this is taking two or three brood frames, shaking them into a bucket, hitting them with a, about a cup of powdered sugar, inverting them, letting the mites drop off, and then we collect them in the field. So uh, we will go through the apiaries. This is the way that we do our monitoring. If we don't find 20 varroa out of those 10 colonies, we say that if there's varroa are effectively under control. Okay, so we can't have the amateurs as the varroa, we can't find varroa. So we bring those back to the lab, we wash the sugar out the mites, we then put them in these glass vials with a white eye pupa, and then we have different concentrations of amitraz. We then measure mortality 24 hours later. And these are held at 34 degrees plus or minus 70% humidity, sort of root conditions. Okay, so then we also have the APFAR efficacy test. I mentioned that these cups have about three to 400 bees in them with the square of APFAR. We then expose them to a certain period of time. You'll see the timing later. We then count the number of mites that fall into this weighing dish that's covered with Vaseline to get the number of mites in the drop. We then wash those bees to get all the mites in the sample. Then we get our total mites. We divide the number in the drop by the total number of mites to get our ape of our efficacy. So if all 10 mites fell in the drop, 100% effective. If we had 10 mites total, five in the drop, 50%. Really simple calculation. 
So what does this look like? After three hours, we get 100% uh, drop in this test. So we measured drop at 30 minutes up to three. We actually did this longer, but at three hours, we found it was 100%. So this is kind of agreeing with what you have. Um, so we know that they're dropping at three hours. So since concentration is constant, we use time as our variable. So three hours is our monitoring time. Uh, we know that these mites are dropping due to apophar exposure because in the control, maybe two or three percent mites drop naturally at three hours. So this is our monitoring, three hours, apophar exposure. And this is a pretty robust system because one of the things that can affect it is temperature, humidity, uh, sunlight, all that kind of stuff. How many bees are in there? How many mites? Well, it's actually really nice that we have some data showing that temperature doesn't matter. Um, whether it's 24 degrees or 39 degrees, don't do that 39 degrees and kill your bees. You get all the mites off, but you also kill your bees. Um, and yes, in Baton Rouge, it gets 39 degrees Celsius, really hot. Um, shade, sun, doesn't matter. So this is really nice that there's not much of a difference. You can see here, 99%, 100%, very, very small. So temperature doesn't matter. We just put them in the shade out in under ambient field conditions. Um, the number of mites in the test doesn't matter. So we still get pretty good control. And then also the number of bees. So this is a pretty resilient system that there's not too many external variables. The only thing that matters is the mites resistance status to <coughs> amitrons. This is good. <clears throat> so what do we do? We started in Louisiana and we had to go late in the summer, so that way there's a maximum period where the bees are, un they are not being treated, and right before honey harvest, because after the honey gets harvested, then they get a treatment. So we needed to go into this very small window. So we left Baton Rouge on the 25th of July, went to upstate New York, then out to the Dakotas, and then about a total of about three weeks on the road. Um, we needed to get away from each other after three weeks, so me and my two technicians went on this trip. So we wanted to work with large-scale commercial beekeepers, 1,000 colonies uh, or more, three years or more of amateurized treatment, and self-reported cases of control failures. The interesting news was that in five of the 11 operations that we worked with, and then seven of 19 aviaries, we couldn't even find enough road to do these tests. So what that suggests is that amateurized resistance isn't necessarily a, a widespread issue. It says that amateurized is still fairly effective in these operations. Now this is kind of interesting because um, there is no really coordinated effort to manage pesticide resistance for amateurs, but yet we still maintain a lot of susceptibility. And I think this is really interesting because if you look at some like BT corn and BT cotton and all that BT stuff, there's been so much effort into product stewardship and use and management, refugia, you name it, and they still get resistance. But amateurs still stays effective for the most part in, in in Varroa. So I think this is interesting that it's not huge, it's not widespread. So this is good news. But when we did find resistance, amateurized resistance appeared to be restricted within an operation and within an apiary. So it looks like every operation is influencing the uh, um, resistance status of amateurs in Varroa. And we also don't see geographic um, distribution of it. It seems to be if you have an apiary here where there's amateurized resistance, your neighbor doesn't have amateurized resistance. So it doesn't look like there's a lot of cross -talk. There's not a lot of drift. However, this is in the summertime, this is not in the fall when we get tip, we get a little bit more drift collapse of columns. So this is kind of just a general overview. All right, so what do we find? So these are the results of the glass vial bioassay test with technical grade amateurs. The different letters represent different beekeeping operations, and the numbers represent different apiaries within that operation. We then have the Amitraz LC50 on the y-axis. And then this number underneath the populations is called the resistance ratio. So we just standardized the LC50 to the USDA lab population. And you can see here we have this range of resistance. We have populations that there is no statistical difference in the Amitraz sensitivity relative to the USDA sensitive population. And this is really nice because the, bees, the mites that we have in the lab, they are susceptible, so this is good. We then also have very low levels of resistance, as you can see in these green ones, less than five-fold. But then in the yellow uh, populations, we start to see about five to ten-fold resistance. And then in the red, we have higher than ten-fold resistance to technical grade amateurs. Now this is really important because in this population, B, this is a control failure. There's, we observed incredibly high mite levels in these populations. Um, overall, there were uh, 11 mites per 100 bees in July, well, late July, early August. That's pretty high. Um, 
we found certain colonies that had 40 mites per 100 bees, so really, really high. Okay, so going on to the next slide, these are the results of the APOVAR efficacy test. Um, these are different uh, apiaries on here and APOVAR efficacy. The only two populations that were statistically different than the sensitive USDA lab population were this C and B population. That B population was the control failure. Remember the one in the previous slide? Now, what's interesting, to be statistically different from the USDA lab population, APOVAR efficacy only needed to be less than 80%. It's still pretty effective, 80% overall. However, where we see the big differences is at the colony level. So if we looked in apiary B where there's this control failure, we have the data on a colony by colony basis. And you can see here there's a lot of variation between colonies. Colony number six, APOVAR was almost 100% effective, whereas in colony number four, it was only about 25% effective. So we have this huge range of variation in sensitivity to amateurs just at the colony level. Now this is kind of interesting because I've heard beekeepers saying, you know, we, are, we treat 20 colonies, this, the, the, the treatment works spectacular in 18 of them. But then in two, it might just go through the roof. And I think this is kind of corroborating a little bit of those anecdotal reports that we've been hearing. So you're not crazy. This is probably what's going on, actually. The intercolony variation quite high. OK, so we have these two measurements of amateur resistance. Let's see how they correlate. So on the x-axis here, we have the amateur resistance ratio from the glass vial bioassay tests, the technical grade amateurs, and then the apovar efficacy. You can see here that these two measurements are highly correlated. Now this is really good news because it shows that reduced APOVAR efficacy yeah. is due to amateurized sensitivity. This is really good. Second thing is it makes it a lot easier to monitor amateurized resistance. The APOVAR efficacy test, you go into your yard, monitor 10 colonies within an hour, and then wait three hours for your results. That's really easy. The amateurized resistance ratio says that's a lot of hard work because you need to wait 24 hours, harvesting the mice, putting them in the vials. It's not fun. This is actually pretty easy. So this is good. We can use these measurements interchangeably. So this makes resistance monitoring much easier. Okay. All right. So the working definition of amateurized resistance leading to control failures are such, is that you have to have an amateurized resistance ratio of tenfold in the glass bio bioassay test, a reduced apovar efficacy of less than 80%, and a varroa infestation of 10 varroa per 100 bees. So this is kind of what Randy was doing. We just standardized it by um, the, the varroa counts by the bee counts. So this is kind of what we're working with. Um, this is going to be different for different times of the year. Probably in the fall when varroa levels get a little bit higher, we're going to have to change this. But for late July, early August, before honey, before treatments, this is kind of what we're going with. This is probably going to change as we get more data, but this is what we're going with right now. Okay. So now that we found that there is amateur resistance, we have to characterize them a little bit more. So we answer the question, yes, yes, amateur resistance does occur. And then we have to find out a little bit about more about how and why. So on this graph, what we have here is the APOVAR efficacy test, right? So as you remember that over time in the susceptibles, we get 100% mortality. And then this is just showing it at 24 hours. I forget how many minutes it is. But you can see here, after three hours in the sensitive stock, it gets to 100%. Now in the resistance stocks, one of two things could probably happen. Either the 100% mortality is just delayed. You can see here the slope is different. Instead of being this quick rise and plateau, maybe it just gradually increases at 24 hours. And at 24 hours, you get 100% mortality. We don't know. I actually think what's going to happen is if we take these resistant varroa, put them into this test and monitor for 24 hours, we'll see a plateau where resistant, where mortality increases, and then it gets to a point where there's just surviving growth. And I think that's gonna be because in the class of bio assay test, we are doing the monitoring 24 hours later. So I, I really think this is what's gonna happen. So again, this year we're gonna have to go find this out. So that curve is important. Ultimately, what we really need to do is just do this in the field. So under realistic conditions, not in a cup, not in a lab, in the hives. So just putting strips of apovar in and for the label treatment, and then finding if my populations increase or decrease. So if you could phenotype them with the apovar efficacy test initially, identify resistant colonies, treat them with apovar normally, and then measure what happens at the end of the treatment period. 
my, my numbers go up, they're resistant, if they go down, they're susceptible. So this is gonna be really important fe news because we have a pretty good idea that they're gonna be resistant. We have to see if it's functionally resistant in the field. I really think it will be though. The other thing that we really need to do is to validate the toxicity of amitraz breakdown products. When you put amitraz in your colony, you're not really putting in amitraz. Amitraz is on the left here. This is the structure. It breaks down to these other two components here in the middle, dimethylformamidine and dimethylformamide. So you can see here, it breaks down and then also goes to dimethylamine. We, don't, we have a good idea what the toxicity of amitraz is to Roa, but we really don't know what it is to DMPF, DMF, or DMA. Uh, good thing is, there's chemical companies that sell this, so that's what we're gonna be working on as soon as row populations get high enough. We also need to determine the biochemical mechanism of resistance. So um, mites, insects, they all become resistant by three major pathways, enhanced detoxification, target site and sensitivity, or reduced penetration. And so what we did in this test was we took those uh, susceptible Varroa from the USDA lab population, and in addition to treating them with, with amitraz, we also use Synergist, PBO, which inhibits P450 detoxification, and DEF, which inhibits esterases. What we found was that there is no difference in the sensitivity, so what that tells us is that these Varroa aren't detoxifying this compound. It's probably a target site mechanism. So we have to find that out. So how do you find that out? You take out the new Corvette. <laughs> so Ariadopoulos is a new, brand new geneticist that we have in the lab, so everybody who was involved of getting us hired, thank you. We hit the home run with this, with this hire. So Ariadne's really, 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 I mean, really good at genetics. So when I was talking to him about this, he says, oh yeah, we can come up with something. So we, what do we do? We submit a Project Apis N grant, and that's what we got awarded. So we're gonna phenotype the resistant row with the aid of our efficacy test, then do whole genome sequencing on 200 samples. That's a lot, and I'm kind of excited for the data. Then we will identify genes associated with amitraz resistance. Like I said, I think it's gonna be target site, octopamine receptors, tyramine receptors, target site things. What we really wanna do then is once we identify the gene, come up with a molecular diagnostic. So you can send us some Varroa in, on, on ice, grind them up, test them, and say, yes, resistant, no, susceptible. And that's gonna be the ultimate goal here, is having this benefit of a low-cost, extensive, rapid evaluation of amateur resistance. That way we don't have to spend weeks on the road, and it could just be, you send us Varroa, and we tell you yes or no. So this is really the goal. So Project APIS has funded this, and so we got our work cut out for us this summer. So why is amitraz resistance so rare? I think it's for a number of reasons. Is that I think that we might have been using too high amitraz in uh, early resistance monitoring. So the Elson paper I mentioned, they found their LC50 for amitraz was 16 micrograms per vial. We found out in our, in our test that it's eight nanograms per vial, which is about 2,000 fold lower. And when I got that result, I was trying to use that as my initial testing. I was killing every row I put in these jars. I said, no, I have to make my concentrations up wrong. Went and made it up again. Still got the same answer. Ordered new amitraz. Made it up a third time, and I still got the same result. So I think that my result is real, and I think the Elzen thing is real. But this just shows that there might be huge differences in amitraz sensitivity through time. So that might be our future, is that 16 nanogram per vial. We'll see. Um, another way is that we might have been misinterpreting the results. So when Jeff Pettis came up with this test for fluvalinate, the threshold for declaring resistance was 25% survivorship. However, if you remember earlier, I was saying it has to be 80% survivorship or, or less to become resistant. And I think that a lot of it is due to the way that just these mites respond to these different materials. Okay, so we just need to rethink this a little bit. So a beekeeper that I was talking to, he did this test out in the field and um, he showed me these results and he said, oh, I think that these are pretty sensitive. 53%, ooh, go back. 53%, 75%, so that's one thing. So survivorship was still lower than the 80% threshold. But notice this too, this is after 12 hours, so it's significantly longer ex extension. If they did this at three hours, I imagine those are gonna be significantly less. So again, coming up with standardized protocols are gonna be really important here. There might be potential fitness costs. So this is something that whenever pests evolve resistance, there's a trade-off, and it's not always what you think it might be. So for example, there are mosquitoes that are resistant to organophosphates. They get caught, they get caught in spider webs more. 
Um, house flies that are resistant to permethrin, they don't detect temperature. Um, that's another one. Um, aphids that are resistant to uh, permethrin, they don't respond to alarm pheromones, so they get eaten a lot more. What's interesting about amitraz is that it's an octopamine mimic, right? Octopamine is a neuromodulator in insects, and it's involved in a lot of different pathways, learning memory, digestion, feeding, but also to reproduction in egg laying. So what we found here, and this is just a hypothesis, this is, might be completely different when we go out and explore this, but as you can see here, when amateurs resistance ratios increase, the varroa infestation levels are decreased, except in this that we're calling control failure. So is varroa reproduction lower as they become resistant? I don't know, potentially. That's something that we're going to have to look at this summer, is just opening up cells and finding out if varroa are reproductive or not. Um, the other big reason is that there's probably less exposure to amitraz than there has been to fluvalinate cumuflas. So you could go out in, in wax comb and detect cumuflas and fluvalinate. It even has been used in like 10, 15 years. The stuff sticks around for a long, long time. Well, if you look at the Mullen paper from 2010, which many people are familiar with, and also Kirsten Trainer's 2016 paper, they showed that DMPF, so this is not amitraz, it's the breakdown part, DMPF. DMPF, cumulophos, and fluvalinate, and these are the concentrations in the wax. You can see here, DMPF is usually lower in concentration than cumulophos or fluvalinate. The numbers on top of these columns also show the percent samples that, uh, in which these materials were detected. So amitraz is found at lower concentrations, and it's found less frequently than cumulophos or fluvalinate. Also, too, DMPF, we have, to know about, we have to find out about its toxicity, whether it's more or less toxic, we don't really know, to, to a varroa. Um, Cumulophos and fluvalinate, how it's found in wax, is still toxic to um, mites. So this is kind of why. So maybe they're just getting much less exposure. We also need to find out about management factors that could be affecting this. So there's a plethora of things. Uh, so use history, how long has it been being used? Um, what's the timing? Is it a spring application, a fall application? Um, how many times? How, what's the intensity? One or two strips per box. Um, migratory route, is this important because when they, when they all come out here, do we get a mixing of these bees? Is that be getting resistance? Uh, queen source, maybe if you pair um, amitraz with VSH bees, you don't have to use as much amitraz, so that can slow down resistance. Um, reports of failure, everybody has a different interpretation of that, but we have to kind of come to the standard definition. But then do also operation size and operation type. So these are all things that we're gonna to try to be answering. We just need to find much, much more resistant mites. So some of the take home messages from today is that amateurs resistance is rare, but detectable. We do found it, we have found it, and we will be looking at it more this summer. Amateurs resistance is restricted within colonies, within operations. So this is some, a very local phenomenon. And then ape of our efficacy test is a reliable surrogate of the amateurs LC250. So we're gonna be looking at this more this summer. So what we want to do is establish what I'm calling the Varroa Resistance Management Network, or the VERNA. And what we really want to do with this is establish collaborating working group to better determine prevalence, intensity, and trends of amateurs resistance, utilize the first research techniques to understand the population genetics and look at biology and biochemistry. We don't want to just superficially ask the question of does it occur. We want to know how, why, so that way we can tackle it and manage it in the most effective way possible. But ultimately what we want to do is come up with practical ways that you could use it. Because I'm, I can't say, go out here and spend an extra 30 minutes on each colony, and have $10 a colony, you're gonna laugh at me. What we want to do is tell you how to use these materials as you normally would in order to extend the life of them. Because we mostly need miticides to do our jobs, right? And as long as we can make them work, the better, that, the better we're gonna be in fight against Barroa. So I want to acknowledge everybody that helped me out this summer, all the beekeepers that let me get into their bees and detect uh, amateur resistance. This was very, 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 very generous of you. So I'm hopefully looking forward to working with the same people and even more this year. Uh, I also want to thank my tech two technicians, Victor and Dave. Dave serving up the heaping, helping of Varroa to Victor. Um, so we spent three weeks on the road and looked for us in an RV coming to an apiary near you this summer. <laughs> So if you have any questions, here's my email, and if we have time for questions. I think we do. We can take a few questions, okay. right? If you leave a strip of ape bar out in the open, after a while you just get that breakdown chemical, right? Which we 
know if it's even to kill my yeah, so the question was, if you left the apovar strip out, does it come that breakdown product? I think it will, I think DMPF will be toxic. I think so, because uh, I was talking to people like Gastonia, and they said that, yeah, it breaks down pretty quickly. And so if that's kind of the idea, and we could still get this um, control with old strips, like Randy just showed, is that I think that DMPF will be toxic, but we have to just, we have to put numbers behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Any recommendation on those really high mite levels that, that one or two hives per bee yard treating them like a owl fruit hive and destroying the whole thing i really can't make any recommendations i don't know so the other thing is we don't really know if those amateur resistant varroa are going to be cross resistant to other stuff i don't know if you put it in kumafos are they just as resistant what are fluvalinate strips i really don't know oxalic acid I, I really can't say that's something that i really want to talk to beekeepers if we do identify it can they do their normal other alternative treatments to get at that point. At this time, I can't make any recommendations. Great. Um, well, we, do, we don't have amtrap resistance, but what we do in the very high mite ones, we break them down to singles. We do a, a 300 mill, milliliter dose of formic acid on them, which does not necessarily kill all the queens, and zeroes the mice out completely high, and we'll just put those singles back on top of a, a, a single with a new queen, and they just take off and do that routinely. Really? Yeah, routinely. Going once, twice. Steve. So if you have identified some resistance. Yes. So that that resistance builds on an exponential curve, right? And these other, you know, when you get one little bit, then you got a little bit longer, larger population. You know, yeah, so, so I think what you're asking is, are we, where are we at? Are we getting, are we on this wave? Are we going up? I really don't know. And the reason why I want them to do this over the summertime is because as soon as that honey comes off, those treatments go on. And so we try to do this in the fall, and when beekeepers were applying oxalic acid, we were getting really high control mortality in our studies, and it was, I was uncomfortable using that data. So that's why it's really critical that we can only evaluate at this point because of just the, the, the cleanness of the data, I guess, because of, of the reduced amount of other factors. But yes, do we go back to those same colonies next year? And is it gonna be higher, is it gonna be lower? We'll find out. What we do, what's the start? So yeah, that's the thing is we have to find out what are some of the genetic factors. Because if we can find out what are some of the, the things that mites are using to become resistant, we can maybe manage for that. We can maybe manage for uh, just doing different met, uh, techniques, uh, reducing those levels earlier in the spring using alternative treatments. Because I think what happens is that this resistance is going to be rare. And I think what happens is when you start a colony off, it starts off with a very small, this is hypothetical, this is not valid. But what I think what happens is that those colonies in the spring, when they make splits, they get started off with a very small population with amateur resistant varroa, and that's what's in that colony throughout that year, right? And I think what happened, and I think that's been shown in that, the intercolony variation. Um, it could be the point of just making sure that we do more intense uh, spring maintenance to make sure that we're going into it with very few mites. Um, we are still trying to put data behind any recommendations. So if you have some, if you have some amateur resistant varroa, come by. <laughs>